Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Current Controversies in the Epidemiology, Diagnosis, and Management of Vaginal Infections. I am Alexis Kraus of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Roche Molecular Diagnostics. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit www.diagnostics.roche.com. Now, let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Christina Musney, Associate Professor, Medicine, Infectious Diseases, University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Medicine. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Musney, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm excited to do this webinar today. And I have to apologize at the very beginning because I have a little bit of a cold. So I'm going to try not to cough, but it may happen. So as mentioned, the title of this presentation is Current Controversies in the Epidemiology, Diagnosis, and Management of Vaginal Infections. And as you all know, this can include BV, trichomonas, and vaginal yeast infections. Because of our time constraint today, I'm mainly going to focus on trichomonas and BV for the purpose of this presentation. I have several disclosures which are listed on this slide. I am currently involved in a BV pathogenesis study as well as a trichomonas treatment trial, which I will mention the results during this presentation. And I'm also a consultant for Lupin Pharmaceuticals. So first, I wanted to talk about several controversies with regards to trichomoniasis. I picked three out of the many controversies that are currently being discussed re regarding trichomonas that I wanted to talk to you all about today. And the first is, should we be screening all women for trichomoniasis, and if so, with what test? The second, which treatment is best for all women? And that gets to this trichomonas treatment trial that we recently published the results on um, just last month in October, um, which talks about whether or not the two gram stat dose of metronidazole or the seven day metronidazole dose is more highly efficacious. And finally, we're getting a lot of cases of refractory trichomoniasis um, that seem to be happening more often, and I wanted to mention that towards the end because the treatment of that is also somewhat controversial. So just to start off talking about screening, I did want to mention some new epidemiological data that was just published a couple of months ago in Clinical Infectious Diseases from the Johns Hopkins group, and this looked at the epidemiology of trichomonas in U.S. men and women in the NHANE cycle from 2013 to 2014. And this was the first time, actually, that men were included um, for trichomonas testing in any of the NHANE studies. So that was a novel part of this to begin with. Um, it was also the first time that people were tested for trichomonas with the Hologic Genprobe Aptima Trichomonas Vaginalis Nucleic Acid Amplification Test. And they found in this study, as you can see on the slide, that the prevalence among U.S. women was 1.8% and men was 0.5%. And these were ages 18 to 59. With regards to trichomonas, it was significantly associated female sex, black race, older age, having less than a high school education, 
being below the poverty level and having greater than two sexual partners in the past year. There is a very pronounced racial disparity for this infection in the black population, which exceeds that of nationally observed data for chlamydia, HSV2, and HPV. It's important to also note that these prevalence estimates exceed estimates of trichomonas in other high-income countries, such as the UK. I also want to mention some epidemiological data from Alabama at our Jefferson County Department of Health STD clinic. Interestingly, this clinic was one of the first STD clinics in the country to implement routine screening for trichomonas with the Hologic Abdomen NAT. Uh, several years ago now, back in 2011, 2012, this was started. And so we had a unique opportunity to review the medical records of these patients um, to see the burden of trichomonas in this clinic population. Uh, and I want to say we see about 18,000 patients a year at this clinic. So basically everybody that comes to this clinic gets screened for trichomonas uh, if they're symptomatic or asymptomatic um, with this nucleic acid amplification test. So we were able to review charts from over 2,500 men and almost 4,000 women between the period of 2012 and 2013. That was basically the first year that both of these groups were screened at this clinic. We found that the overall prevalence was very high at 20%. Basically, one out of every four patients coming to this clinic had trichomonas infection. Um, and when we looked at it stratified by gender, 27% in women and 9.8% in men. Uh, the correlates of trichomonas in women were older age, again, African-American race, um, having white blood cells on a wet mount, an elevated vaginal pH, a positive WIF test, and being co-infected with gonorrhea. In men, it was also older age, African-American race, and having greater than five PMNs on a urethral gram stain. And it's important to note that in this study, we also do wet mount at this clinic, by the way, for women, but it's important to note that using the trichomonas NAT, we detected a third more trichomonas infections in women than using wet mount alone. However, despite the high prevalence of trichomonas nationally and here in Alabama, trichomonas is a neglected STI, and there are several reasons for this. There are no established screening, surveillance, or control programs for women or men for trichomonas in the United States. Right now, in the 2015 CDC STD treatment guidelines, which is our most recent published guidelines, routine screening is only recommended in HIV-positive women at entry to care and then annually. Screening is considered for persons in other high prevalence settings, which I have listed here, and asymptomatic persons at high risk, but this is not consistently done throughout the country. So why are we not having screening recommendations and why do we have a lack of national surveillance for trichomonas? So this is a very controversial issue. Um, and basically, there are seven criteria to um, be a nationally reportable disease, which I have listed on this slide. So you need to have a very frequent, prevalent disease. It has to have associated disparities or inequities. It has to be communicable. It has to have severity associated with it, associated cost to the healthcare system, means to prevent it, and public interest in decreasing rates of this infection. And there's a very interesting paper written in the Sexually Transmitted Diseases Journal in 2013, which I have listed on the bottom of the slide if you're ever interested in reading this paper, that kind of discusses which of these criteria that the authors thought trichomonas fulfills, which was only three out of these seven. They thought um, it is a frequent disease. There are disparities, particularly in the African-American population, and we do know that it's an STD, so it is communicable. However, there's a lot of controversy about the severity of trichomonas and its associated complications. Um, a lot of people think that trichomonas is mainly seen in asymptomatic patients. Um, not necessarily everyone is symptomatic, and there's some debate about whether or not trichomonas causes complications, such as preterm birth 
and acquisition of HIV and other STDs. This has not been studied in detail. Um, associated cost with trichomonas is not also well studied, so it's hard to make uh, a determination on that criteria. Uh, there's no data on whether a national control program could reduce trichomonas prevalence. And in this 2013 STD paper, uh, they were basically stating that there's a lot of issues with chlamydia uh, national control programs that are currently going on. And so they had major concerns that trichomonas would have similar issues. And also, apparently, there's a lack of public interest in trichomonas. But I personally have to say, if there, you know, I don't, if the public doesn't know about it, how do we know whether or not they have interest in it? I mean, we hear about HIV a lot and syphilis a lot and genital herpes in um, public advertisements, and we hear about antibiotic-resistant gonorrhea, we don't see as much, we don't hear as much about trichomonas. And so it's hard to gauge what the public interest is in trichomonas. In addition, not all successful STI control measures are currently being used for trichomonas to help decrease its high prevalence. So I have listed here all uh, many STI control measures that have been successful in the past for other STIs. This is use of sensitive screening tests. So trichomonas, we do have the nucleic acid amplification test, but they're not being widely used. Um, a lot of STD clinics and other clinics are mainly using wet mounts. Um, some clinics are using nucleic acid amplification tests, uh, but the majority of clinics that I have talked to that are using them are mainly using them in women, perhaps in symptomatic heterosexual men, but that's not standardized. Um, also, another successful measure is availability of effective, affordable medicines, which metronidazole we use to treat trichomonas is the most affordable treatment for any sexually transmitted infection. Um, accurate reporting of cases is currently not available for trichomonas because it's not a nationally reportable disease. Um, and initiation of mandatory reporting to the CDC is not done uh, because right now they're saying it only meets three out of the seven criteria, which I just reviewed. And then treatment of infective partners, which is basically expedited partner therapy. Um, it's not clear to me right now how often this is being done for trichomonas. Um, EPT is permissible in the majority of U.S. states, but not all states. And um, just from anecdotally talking to other people, I have been told that EPT is mainly being done more for chlamydia and gonorrhea than it is for trichomoniasis. Um, my next slide shows the legal status of expedited partner therapy across the country. This is from the CDC website, and this is updated. And as you can see, the majority of states across the country are green, which is the permissible color, meaning that EPT is permissible in that state. Unfortunately, right now, my state, Alabama, is potentially allowable. Um, even though that they say that it is potentially allowable, our health department clinics while we are screening all men and all women that come to clinic for trichomonas with the NATS, we are not doing, we are not allowed to do EPT um, at our clinics here in the state. Uh, there are two states, Kentucky and South Carolina, where it is prohibited. So I think for those four criteria that trichomonas is said not to currently meet, I think we need some additional data to help support that trichomonas meets those criteria um, to help push the fact that we need to have this to be a nationally reportable disease uh, and to start routinely screening all women and perhaps men in the country. Um, the, second, the second thing I want to talk about is if we are screening people, what tests are we going to use? Well, for the most part, in the past, the wet mount has been the most commonly used test for trichomonas. This is a rapid point-of-care test that is very cheap. Um, it, it, I do want to note that it must be performed in 10 to 20 minutes after you get a vaginal, vaginal specimen collection or the trichomonads will lose viability. Um, and then we can see the organism on the wet mount under the microscope. This test, the main problem with it is that it has very low sensitivity, even in the best of hands. However, the specificity, when you see the trichomonas swimming on the slide, um, is a very good specificity. 
Uh, another rapid point of care test that we have available is the awesome test stick, which is a rapid antigen test for trichomonas. This can be performed on vaginal secretions. It uses antibodies to detect trichomonas protein antigens. It has a higher sensitivity than the wet mount at 83% with a specificity of 97%. It has not been validated in men to date, so this has only been used in women. Um, a positive test shows that you have detection of trichomonas antigen as determined on this, as shown in this picture on this slide with a red control line. Um, you can get the results in 10 minutes, so it can be done in clinic while the patient is waiting. It is more expensive than a wet mount. Um, when I looked up the cost online, it, it appears to be about $12 per test, and you also have to buy a positive control kit, which I saw was priced at approximately $40. Uh, trichomonas can be seen on pap smear that women are having for cervical cancer screening. Um, I get a, a few occasional calls every year from people that got a pap smear result with trichomonas on it, and they ask me what do I need to do. And I always tell them if you see trichomonas on a pap smear, it's there, and you definitely need to treat the patient. So I don't think people are using pap smears to screen for trichomonas, um, but I think if you see it on there, you should treat for it. And I have the sensitivity and specificity in the conventional PAPs and the liquid-based PAPs mentioned on this slide, as you can see. Uh, the trichomonas culture has been the gold standard for diagnosis traditionally. Um, this is where you inoculate a swab of vaginal fluids into the in-pouch culture. Um, and you basically have to incubate that at 37 degrees. And it has to be read multiple times over three to five days to see if you see trichomonas under the microscope. So this does represent a lot of substantial delays between obtaining the swab from the patient and getting the final test results, especially if it has to be read up to five days. Um, here again, the uh, sensitivity is 100% with the speci uh, specificity 44 to 75% on this slide. It's also important to note when you want to do susceptibility testing, you need to do a trichomonas culture so you can culture the, the um, parasite uh, to be able to do the susceptibility testing on it. So I wanted to briefly mention these nucleic acid amplification tests because we have several now, which is really exciting for this field. The first one that I mentioned, which we use at our clinic and was used in the NHANES data, is the hologic abdomen trichomonas NAT, which was the first FDA-approved NAT for use in women. Um, it can be used in men if your lab internally validates it. It is not currently FDA-approved in men. So here in Alabama, our lab, our, health, our central health department lab, has validated this test, which is how we can use it for patient care and give results to patients. It has excellent sensitivity and specificity. And the assay performance is similar in asymptomatic and symptomatic women uh, in the studies. Um, we do use it on urine specimens. We also use it on vaginal specimens and cervical specimens that are collected. Um, I have been told that this test uh, costs about $90, but it is important to note that the test is also being used for gonorrhea uh, and chlamydia, nucleic acid amplification testing. So they're all, you're getting basically for $90, you're getting all three of these organisms tested for. Uh, the next NAT, which was published and became FDA approved was in 2014, which was the BD Probe Tech Trichomonas NAT. Um, and in this study, published in the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, it was found to have superior performance to the wet mount, and it was found to be equivalent with the Aptima Trichomonas NAT. Um, I have been told that this test is slightly cheaper than the Hologic Aptima test, which could be a benefit. But neither of these tests are rapid point-of-care tests. Recently, however, we've had the Cepheid Expert Trichomonas Nucleic Acid Amplification Test, which was FDA approved in women and men in 2017. And the paper on that study was just published earlier this year in the Journal of Clinical Microbiology. This was a very large study that looked at the assay in women and men, so it's important to note that this assay is FDA-approved in men. 
as well as women. And it's also important to note that the assay can provide on-demand results in 63 minutes or less, with early termination for positive results within 40 minutes. So this assay could be used for diagnosis in real-time clinics if patients are willing to wait 40 to 60 minutes for their test results. This test can also, um, the swab for this test is also being used for gonorrhea and chlamydia detection. And I'm told that the cost for the Cepheid NAT is around $130. So out of the three NATs, um, this test is the most expensive. However, it is FDA approved in men and you can get faster test results, which could potentially be used in real time if you have a machine running this test in your clinic. So if you ask, if we're screening all women uh, and potentially men, what tests should we use? Well, we have a large number of tests. Um, and it, it, you know, to determine that the best test with the highest sensitivity and specificity are the NATs. However, cost is obviously much more than a wet mount or a rapid antigen test. Um, so you have to weigh the, the pros and cons of all of these different diagnostic tests for your, your budget constraints, uh, your time in clinic, and the time that patients are willing to sit and wait for their test results, or if they want to leave the clinic and get their test results called to them later. So I want to spend the second part of the trichomonas section talking about treatment, um, because this is evolving over time. <clears throat> As per the 2015 CDC STD treatment guidelines, the preferred regimen are the STAT doses, the two grams of metronidazole or tenidazole. And the alternative regimen is 500 milligrams twice daily of metronidazole for seven days. It is important to note that this regimen of seven days is the preferred regimen for HIV positive women in the 2015 CDC STD treatment guidelines. And that recommendation was based on a randomized controlled trial now that was published back in 2010 um, from a study done in Houston, Texas, New Orleans, Louisiana, and Jackson, Mississippi that found that the seven-day metronidazole dose in HIV-positive women with trichomoniasis was more highly efficacious than the two-gram STAT dose. And in this study, it was thought that uh, co-infection with bacterial vaginosis was one factor that was associated with early failure of the single dose treatment. It is well known that we treat BV for se uh, with seven days of metronidazole currently. So in intuitively, it makes sense that if you're also co-infected with BV, um, the seven day dose of metronidazole also treated trichomonas better. A meta-analysis was recently done for all of the studies uh, looking at the two gram stat dose of metronidazole versus the seven day dose in all women. And this was published last year in the STD journal. <coughs> I have to get a small drink of water, I'm sorry. This meta analysis looked at seven studies, including that one study for the HIV positive women, which I just mentioned, that was published in 2010 2011 by Dr. Kissinger in New Orleans. Uh, this meta-analysis found that overall, between all seven of these studies, the seven-day metronidazole dose seemed to be more highly efficacious for all women, not just HIV-positive women, leading to the suggestion that perhaps we should make the seven-day dose the preferred regimen for all women. However, until recently, we did not have a robust randomized controlled trial looking at the two gram stat dose versus the seven day dose head to head in HIV uninfected women. That leads me into our study that was published just last month in the Lancet Infectious Disease. It's currently electronically published online if you're interested in looking at the study. Um, and this was comparing those two doses head to head in HIV uninfected women. And so our clinic here in Birmingham was uh, very integral into this study. Um, we enrolled over 400 women here, and they enrolled an additional 200 plus women in Jackson, Mississippi and New Orleans, Louisiana. As you can see, women were recruited for this study between October of 2014 um, up until April of 2017. 
They were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to one of these medications. And the primary outcome of this study was trichomonas infection by intention to treat at test of cure four weeks after completion of treatment. And women were diagnosed in this study uh, by the NAT and or culture. The analysis of this primary outcome was also stratified by BV status, given the results of that 2010 HIV positive study uh, that I mentioned. And BV in this study was defined by Nugent score on a vaginal gram stain. On this next slide, you can see the baseline characteristics of the intent to treat population. There was not any significant differences between the seven day, the baseline characteristics of women in the seven day dose group or the single dose metronidazole group. In this next slide, uh, you can see that we assessed over 1,000 patients for eligibility in this study. A total of 623 were randomly assigned to the treatment groups. As I mentioned, about 400 here at UAB. Uh, it is important to mention that self-reported adherence was high in the single dose group, which was given as directly observed therapy in the clinic, but also high in the seven day dose group at 96%. Uh, these percentages were not significantly different between groups. Side effects were also similar by group. And here in this table two, which is the primary outcome and sensitivity analysis, you can see that women, with this first red circle on the slide, women who received the seven-day dose of metronidazole had a 45% reduction in their risk of having uh, recurrent trichomoniasis at their test of cure visit. So basically, the seven-day metronidazole dose was more highly efficacious in women that were treated with this dose compared to the two gram stat dose. In contrast to the HIV positive study, BV status had no effect on the relative risk in this study. There were some people who had concerns that we were basing the test of cure status on NAT as part of our analysis, so we did a, a separate sensitivity analysis in the study where we used only trichomonas culture positive culture at test of cure, as you can see in the second red circle at the bottom of this slide. And in the sensitivity analysis, our initial study findings still held up, uh, basically stating that the seven-day dose was more highly efficacious uh, than the two-gram stat dose in HIV uninfected women. So there are several implications for this new treatment study. Um, basically, there is now good data to suggest that the seven-day metronidazole dose should be the preferred dose for all women, not just HIV-positive women. Uh, based on this RCT and the meta-analysis, which I mentioned, in addition, as I mentioned in the current NHANES data, we have a very large ongoing burden of trichomonas in women. So we want to treat these women with the best medications that we have possible. However, there have been some concerns about going to a seven-day regimen over a stat dose for the preferred regimen. Uh, there are people that are concerned that treatment adherence issues could uh, impact this. Um, in our randomized controlled trial, treatment adherence was not a problem in the seven-day dose group, but that was a highly controlled clinical trial setting, and there's not a lot of data in the real world on this topic. So we're going to be investigating that going forward to get some data with that. Also, right now, the current recommendation to treat men with trichomoniasis is with two grams stat metronidazole. There is no RCT data at all in men comparing the two grams versus the seven days that is robust. So if women are treated with seven days, but men are still treated with two days, and we counsel all of them to refrain from sex, there could be a conflict in the timing of abstinence from sex, which could put the couple at risk for re-exposure. So counseling is going to need to be very important if we're going to be treating women and men differently for the same STD moving forward until we have data for men. It's also unclear how this will affect EPT for trichomonas vaginalis. So we have a review article on these implications of this study that is currently at a journal, so hopefully that can get published in the next couple of months. 
um, if you're interested in looking for that for the future, because it goes into detail about some of these issues. One other thing I wanted to talk about is a new medication called cyclinazole, which is in the same drug class as metronidazole and tenidazole for um, trichomoniasis. Cyclinazole has a longer half-life than metronidazole and tenidazole, which makes it attractive to use as a one-time dose. And so there, there are going to be some studies coming up in the future um, of looking at cyclinazole for the treatment of trichomoniasis. It was recently FDA approved in the United States for a treatment of bacterial vaginosis. So we're curious if, if cyclinazole can also be used for the treatment of trichomoniasis with a longer half-life. And perhaps if, if we do find some good data for this, we could go back to a single one-time dose of a medication for trichomoniasis. But right now, based on the current data, it looks like we're headed towards a seven-day dose of metronidazole. Finally, the last thing in the trichomonas section I want to talk about is refractory trichomoniasis. Um, and this is where women are persistently infected. Basically, we need to distinguish this from reinfection from an untreated sexual partner. So obviously, uh, a very good history uh, for a patient that comes back that still has persistent trichomonas infection is needed. So basically, these are patients that come in, they have TRIC, we, we give them either a 2-gram stat dose or a 7-day dose. They say they take it, but they come back to clinic a couple weeks later, still with uh, complaints, and they're still found to have trichomonas, and that's when we get into this issue. I do want to mention that based on the data that we do have, resistance to the five nitrometazoles, which is going to be metronidazole and tenidazole right now, is not very high. Um, it's about 4.3 to 5% um, based on this most recent study, now six years ago, um, from the STD surveillance network. This is from six STD clinics across the country. And so it looks like the majority of resistance in this study of trichomonas isolates, which had 538 isolates in this study, was low-level resistance um, to metronidazole. There was no high-level resistance seen in this study. And it appears that low-level metronidazole resistance can be overcome by using tenidazole. So basically, right now, the recommendations uh, in the setting of dosing for drug resistance and persistent infection, if your patient was first treated with trichomonas with 2 grams of metronidazole, you would want to avoid redosing them with that same single dose. So you would go ahead and give them for the second round of treatment 500 milligrams twice a day for seven days. If this does not work and they still have trichomonas, you would want to consider performing susceptibility testing on the isolate. Uh, if your lab does that, that's great, or you can send it to the CDC um, to be done there. Also, at that time, you would want to give metronidazole or tenidazole uh, at, a high, at, at the 2-gram dose, instead of a stat dose, you would want to give it longer for 5 to 7 days. In addition, there is some anecdotal data about intravaginal paramomycin cream in combination with high-dose tenidazole, intravaginal boric acid, or nidazoxanide. It is important to note that these intravaginal preparations have to be made in a compounding pharmacy, and they, they can get pretty expensive for patients. So you can't just call Walmart or CVS um, and, and order these medications. You have to order them at a compo uh, compounding pharmacy, and the patient has to pick them up. In addition, high-dose tenidazole at 2 to 3 grams daily in combination with intravaginal tenidazole twice daily for 14 days may also be useful in these settings. I have listed on this slide some other medications that have been tried, mainly intravaginal preparations that are not currently recommended. And all of these recommendations are currently listed in the 2015 CDC STD treatment guidelines. There is no consensus for the treatment of refractory trichomoniasis. So basically, these are some recommendations, but there's no good randomized controlled data for these patients. So I'm going to move quickly to bacterial vaginosis um, and mention a couple of controversies for BV and shift gears for us. Uh, obviously, the number one controversy for BV is what causes BV. We still don't know the exact etiology. I could actually talk about that for hours. I'm just going to mention it for just a few minutes here. 
Um, it's still a little controversial if BV is an STD or not. I think the majority of epidemiological data points to the fact that it is. Um, and so the main thing right now is that what is causing BV. Also, how to prevent high BV recurrence rates, which we see all the time, women with recurrent BV. And finally, another controversy is should we treat sexual partners of women with BV, particularly in the setting of where we're concerned that it's an STD. So BV is the most common cause of vaginal discharge in women. It has multiple complications, as I have listed on this slide. And it is known that BV is characterized by depletion of lactic acid producing lactose and increases in Gardnerella vaginalis, which is a facultative anaerobe, and other strict anaerobes. However, its etiology and incubation period remain unknown, but the epidemiology strongly supports that it is acquired via sexual transmission. I have several bullet points listed on this slide um, that are epidemiological data that are in support of BV being sexually transmitted. I'm not going to read through all of these on this webinar because of time constraints, but you're more than uh, welcome to go back and look at this slide. There's a great review article that I have listed at the bottom of this slide uh, that goes into details for some of these original studies, which are referenced in that article if you want to go back and read more about that. Our group does have a model, uh, a hypothesis for the etiology of BV. Um, there are several competing hypotheses. Some people think that it's one bacteria, uh, particularly Gardnerella vaginalis. We call that the primary pathogen model. There are other people that think that BV is sexually transmitted by a polymicrobial consortium of microorganisms. That's the polymicrobial pathogen model. Uh, there's a paper here in the Journal of Infectious Diseases in 2014 that's listed on this slide that goes into detail about these two models and the pros and cons of each. Um, there's also a lactobacillus depletion model, which is not discussed in this paper on this slide, but it is discussed in other papers. You may see something about that out in the literature. Some people think that just losing your lactose without introduction of a pathogen can perhaps lead to BV. The diagnosis of BV in clinical care, as you all know, is made by the AMSEL criteria. Three out of four of these criteria are needed for diagnosis, which I have the criteria listed on the slide. Uh, clue cells on a wet mouth vaginal fluid are one of these criteria. A uh, clue cell, obviously, is uh, a, a, a squamous epithelial cell that's sloughed off from the vaginal canal that's coated with all of these uh, facultative and strict anaerobic bacteria. In research settings, we diagnose BV more rigorously using the Nugent score from a vaginal gram stain, which I have pictures of different uh, scoring categories for Nugent score listed on this slide. Zero to three is a lactobacillus predominant optimal vaginal flora. Four to six is intermediate flora, and seven to 10 is disappearance of the lactose with numerous Gardnerella vaginalis, mobilonchus, and other strict anaerobes. The treatment of BV is listed on this slide with the CDC 2015 guidelines. I did, need, I did mean to mention earlier that we're going to have new CDC STD treatment guidelines coming out in 2020. So those will be coming out probably in the next 18 to 24 months. So be on the lookout for that. So this whole thing with BV treatment, recurrence is very common. So women come in, they get diagnosed with BV, they get treated with one of those regimens. Recurrence is very, very common. This one study published now almost 12 years ago showed that at 28 weeks, BV recurrence occurred in 51% of women uh, that were on a suppressive metronidazole therapy and 75% of women that were just on placebo. So those are very high recurrence rates, even in the, the face of suppressive therapy. So why is BV recurring so much in all of these women? Well, it was recently determined that BV is a biofilm community. And the biofilm is actually what you're seeing on these clue cells. The clue cells are being sloughed off from this biofilm, which is basically a layer of slime glycocalyx on the vaginal epithelial cells. Um, Alexander Swazinski in Germany was one of the first to report on this BV biofilm. I have a picture of a clue cell here with the biofilm. 
Um, and he found that Gardnerella vaginalis, I'm actually going to go to the next slide. This is one of the Sentinel studies on it. Uh, Swazinski found that Gardnerella vaginalis is the bacteria that made up the majority of the BV biofilm mass, followed by Adipobium vaginae and much smaller numbers of lactobacillus species, which makes sense because lactose are depleted in a BV state. Um, so we basically think that the BV biofilm is what's causing a lot of treatment recurrence and that the current, currently recommended treatments are not necessarily completely killing the BV biofilm. I do want to mention in line with my discussion about BV being an STD, they have found in follow-up studies with this BV biofilm that it involves women and their male sexual partners. And uh, here again, people felt like this biofilm is sexually transmitted in these studies, which also gives more epidemiological evidence that BV is an STD. So this is an interesting study looking at tr sexual transmission of this BV biofilm between women, their male sexual partners, and controls. If you're interested, it was published in 2010. I have it listed on this slide. So to improve BV recurrence rates, the current thought in the field is we need to disrupt the biofilm. So currently, the, the therapies used may not be doing this effectively. So it may be happening in the future where we are treating women with BV with more than one medication. We may be using an oral medication with an intravaginal biofilm disrupting agent, for example. So this may be something coming down the pipeline in the future. Um, there have been a few studies looking at different agents to treat the BV biofilm, several of which I have listed on these slides. Um, one is intravaginal boric acid, which has been used for uh, BV in the past. It has also been used for uh, vaginal yeast infections, and as I mentioned earlier, it, it's an anecdotal treatment for refractory trichomoniasis. So one study uh, has looked at intravaginal boric acid. They have a little bit of success with it, not a lot. This was a very small study. It was not adequately powered. Uh, and so intravaginal boric acid right now is not recommended in the CDC treatment guidelines until much larger, well-powered studies uh, are included. But it is a potential option that needs to be explored further. Um, another agent that's been used is this agent called octinonide. octinide. Um, this has been see, uh, used in one study as a biofilm disrupting agent. However, it was not very effective. Uh, initial cure rates were high, but relapse was very, very high. So I'm not sure you're going to hear much more about this agent just because this study did not show great uh, use of this medication um, with high relapse rates. Um, another biofilm disrupting agent is DNAs, which this has been found to inhibit Gardnerella vaginalis biofilms in vitro and in vivo. Uh, this is something that may be looked at more in the future. And the most recent study, which was actually just published about two months ago, was a novel formulation of intravaginal boric acid. Um, that is more uh, by this company, Toltec, um, that was found to be efficacious in treating women with BV. Uh, this boric acid agent is um, enhanced with EDTA, which the older intravaginal boric acid preparation in that older 2009 study was not, so that's the novel part of this new study. Um, and this EDTA specifically targets vaginal bacterial and fungal biofilms. Um, and so they found that uh, using this special formulation of the boric acid was able to treat a substantial number of women with BV. So um, this could be a potential biofilm disrupting agent in the future. They have not yet looked at it in women with uh, recurrent BV. So that's something that will be going on in the future. 
The last thing I wanted to mention quickly is what about treating sexual partners of women with BV? That's controversial right now. Right now, the 2015 CDC STD treatment guidelines do not recommend treating partners of women with BV. This was based on the results of prior clinical trials, which I have listed on this slide. Uh, they're all male partner treatment trials. There's uh, six of them. They've all been conducted uh, in the 1980s and the 1990s. They were not conducted rigorously. Five out of these six trials did not show that treatment of the male sexual partner of women with recurrent BV was helpful. And because of these studies, it is not currently recommended to do that. However, there was a meta-analysis of these studies done in the Sexually Transmitted Diseases Journal in 2012, which found that these studies have major issues, all of them in their methodologies. Um, and we need new studies in the current era that have rigorous methodologies to look at this issue again, particularly as we think that BV is an STD, to help sort this issue out. So there's only this one trial out of the six that showed a partial effect of treating male partners. This study found that at two and five weeks, women whose partners were treated with metronidazole were less, had less BV by vaginal gram stain on the Nugent score. And at eight weeks, these women whose partners were treated were more likely to report resolution of their BV symptoms. But as you can see, this, this study was done way back in 1989. The sample size was small. The results were presented graphically. They did not have effect sizes in their study. Um, and even though this study showed some positive results because it was such a, uh, it was not rigorously conducted, the CDC treatment guidelines does not recommend treatment right now. I, I do want to call your attention to a pilot study of male partner treatment that was recently completed to look at the acceptability of treating male partners. The study was done by Kat Bradshaw and her group in Australia, and they only had 16 men in this study, so it was a small sample size. Um, women in the study got oral metronidazole for several seven days, and they treated male sexual partners for seven days with oral metronidazole plus 2% topical clitomycin cream which they applied topically to the head of the penis twice daily for seven days. Note that this study was done in, in Australia, and they treat BV there with 400 milligrams twice daily for seven days of metronidazole, not 500 milligrams as we do here in the United States. For the acceptability, they found that 88% of the men in the study took over 90% of their tablets, and 69% applied over 90% of the clindamycin doses. So they did find that this treatment was acceptable in these men. They did not have a lot of adverse effects. And they also found the impact on the penile microbiota of using these medications in men is that they reduced a significant amount of BV-associated bacteria, which they found in uh, microbiome specimens collected in this study. So this is... Uh, an interesting study that, that we need more data on this topic. There is one well-controlled, well-developed, randomized controlled trial of treatment of the male sexual partners of women with recurrent BV that is currently enrolling in the United States. And this study is being done at Wayne State University in Detroit and also here at UAB. Um, it's a phase three study. Uh, they've, they've enrolled 200-plus women to date. All of the women in the study have to have recurrent BV to be enrolled. They're getting seven days of metronidazole for treatment, and their regular male sexual partner is being randomized to placebo or seven days of oral metronidazole. The primary outcome for the study is going to be BV by AMSOS criteria and Nugent score at 16 weeks. So these couples are being followed long-term. And I do also want to say I'm not, I am not immediately involved in this study. One of my colleagues here at UAB, Jane Schwebke, is doing the study. 
but I, I have been told that there is a couples verification tool used in this study to, to make sure that these couples are actually couples um, and not uh, people that are not couples uh, because this can definitely affect the, the primary outcome. It can found the study results. So I know I just went over a large amount of information in a 50-minute period of time. I think we have about 10 minutes for questions, and I'm happy to send this back to our moderator and take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Musney, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the answer question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, from a patient care perspective, what are the most common empiric treatments given to patients with idiopathic signs of vaginitis? and what diagnostic or clinical tools might reduce empiric therapy in this era of antibiotic stewardship? So I think a patient complaining of vaginal symptoms, I would definitely recommend that they go and be seen by a provider. Um, it's been shown many times in prior studies that a phone diagnosis of a particular vaginal infection is not correlated with exactly what the patient has. So I think the patient would need to go into clinic and get an exam or at least do a self-collected vaginal swab so we can at least do a wet mount to see if they have trichomonas um, and to see if they have AMSEL criteria. And that way we can direct our therapy based on what they have. Um, we can also see uh, the yeast forms on the wet mount and the KOH prep uh, to diagnose a vaginal yeast infection. So in this situation, uh, for a vaginitis patient, I think they need an exam and they need a wet mount at minimum to help determine appropriate therapy. Now our next question. From a diagnostics perspective, is there a consensus, or excuse me, is there a consensus in the field for which analytes are most appropriate for a molecular BV test? There is not a consensus in the field on that topic, no. Not that I'm aware of. All right, let's move on to our next question. To your knowledge, does the NAT diagnosis of T vaginalis uh, differ based on the life cycle stage of the organism? No, the, the nucleic acid amplification test is going to detect uh, DNA of the organism and it does not matter what stage of the life cycle that the organism is in. If, if the organism is there, the test is going to detect it. Now, is there a need for at-home self-collected methods for diagnosis of vaginitis-associated pathogens and or BV? And how might these improve patient access to care and or impact the in-clinic demands of HCPs? Um, I think, obviously, trichomonas is a major issue in this country. Bacterial vaginosis is as well. So I think if there were options for patients to self-test at home um, to, to get their results and call their doctor to potentially get treatment, I think that would be great. Um, right now, I don't think that we're at that point. Um, and for example, for trichomonas, uh, we have the, the rapid point of care tests that I mentioned, which were the wet mount and the OSM rapid antigen test. Obviously, the wet mount is going to require someone to read that under a microscope, which patients are not going to be able to do that. Uh, the rapid antigen test uh, is currently only being used in, in clinical settings, to my knowledge. Um, I'm not aware that that test is commercially available. So I do think there is a need for that, but I don't think that we're there yet. And Dr. Mosny, it looks like we have time for one more question. Is there any reason at all why the CDC guidelines for treatment exclude male partners? Uh, are we talking about trichomonas or BV? Um, you know, it's, we 
don't know, uh, TV. TV. For uh, if this is if the question is about trichomonas, the CDC yes, guidelines actually do recommend that male sexual partners of women with trichomonas do get treated. I'm sorry if I did not say that earlier in my presentation. So we do know that trichomonas is an STD. And so all partners of an infected woman should get treated. My, my comment earlier during my presentation is that expedited partner therapy, where basically you give the medication to the woman to distribute herself to the partners, it is not clear how often that is being done in clinics around the country. And it's not permissible in all states, including my state here in Alabama. With regards to BV, the CDC guidelines currently do not recommend treatment of male sexual partners, and that was based on the negative results of the prior randomized control trials of treatment of men. But as I mentioned, those trials had multi multiple methodological issues, and we have that new trial that's currently enrolling here in the United States, which can hopefully once the data is available from that trial, can hopefully shed more light on that issue to where it might lead to a change in these recommendations. I hope that clarified that question. Thank you, Dr. Musney. Do you have any final comments for our, for our audience? I think I covered a lot, <laughs> so I don't have anything else right now. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Christina Musney, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank Lebert and our sponsor, Roche Molecular Diagnostics, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand through May of 2019. Labyrinths will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.